Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for being with us today. The topic we're going to be looking at in the Bible is called A House Divided Will Not Stand. Abraham Lincoln gave a speech in 1858 called The House Divided Speech. He was running for the Senate seat in the state of Illinois. He was running against Stephen Douglas. He ended up losing that Senate race, but then two years later, in 1860, he ran for the Republican ticket for the President of the United States, and he won on the same platform, that he lost the Senate seat two years earlier. He quoted that Jesus said something important in Matthew, the 12th chapter. So let's begin there, Matthew 12, beginning in verse 22 and see why Abraham Lincoln chose this passage to have his platform be built on something solid to really help the country. Matthew 12 and verse 22, Then they brought him a demon-possessed man, in other words, they brought to Jesus, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. And all the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? In verse 24, But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Now they were trying to knock down the validity of Jesus having the authority to cast out demons. So they made this false claim. The only way he could have cast it out is by Beelzebub, the devil. Kind of foolish when you think about it, but obviously they weren't thinking about it right then. In verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. So Jesus gave a godly principle. He said everything that was divided, that should be united, will fail if it's divided. Everything. To the smallest relationship to the largest relationship. From a family being strong, to a city being strong, to a state being strong, to a nation being strong, to a world being strong. It applies in every situation. So he says in verse 26, if Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. He would have defeated himself if he had been the one to cast the demon out. How can his kingdom stand? Totally illogical to think that it could. And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So he put the question right back to them. By whom do you cast out demons? Because they did as well. They, in the name of God, they would cast out a demon if it were necessary to do, and by God's authority given to them as the Pharisees. So then they will be your judges. They will judge by whom you use as the, your authority to cast out demons. In verse 28, but if it is by the Spirit of God, that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So he said, if the Spirit of God has cast these, this demon out, well then the, the kingdom of God, and he was the king of that kingdom, would be right there in front of you. It would be upon you. It's only by the Spirit of God that anyone's able to cast out a demon, because we use this authority given to us as believers in Jesus and the kingdom of God. It's by his authority that we would do it, not our own. Then in verse 29, or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? So the only one who could do that, the only one who's defeated Satan, is Jesus. So by the authority of Jesus, then he has to tie up the strong man so the house can be clean. But as it says in other places, if Jesus doesn't enter into the clean house, 
Well, then the demon would go and get seven of his friends and come back and re-inhabit the house or the person. So, this is going to show that there's only one way that a demon can be cast out of a person. It's by the representative of the kingdom of God, or to be inspired by someone with a, the spirit of God to do so. And that would be uh, anybody today who believes in Jesus and knows that they have a ministry to do to help people be free from demonic control. So, anyway, a strong man has to be bound up first, and that is Jesus. And he ties up the strong man, then he can plunder his house. That's verse 29. So, we cannot drive out demons except by the Spirit of God. That's what Jesus is saying. When that happens, the kingdom of God comes upon us. It's revealed. The kingdom of God is in force when that happens. The authority of God in Jesus has been expressed. So the king of the kingdom of God is Jesus. And that kingdom is also known as the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of light. So let's go to Colossians 1 where the Apostle Paul talks about the kingdom of light and our being in it, ministers of it, being ambassadors of that kingdom of light today because we've been reconciled by what Jesus did on the cross, forgiving our sins and His resurrection from the dead, giving us His spirit life. So over in Colossians 1 and verse 9, let us begin there. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. See, just all the blessings of God the Apostle Paul is wishing upon the people in Colossae and then for us today. In verse 12, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. So again, it's because Jesus died on the cross and his shed blood has forgiven us our sins and his risen life has given us his spirit life, we are now reconciled to our heavenly Father. And because that is true then, we all have been qualified through what Jesus has done to be in the inheritance as his holy people in the kingdom of light. And then in verse 13 it says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. So it's by his authority then that we do what we do as children of his in the kingdom of light today. But he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And that is an important thing for us to be rescued from because darkness doesn't lead to life. It leads to death. In verse 14, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then down um, here in verse, um, verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And that's also found over in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 14 through 21. In verse 21 then of Colossians 1, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. See, they were partaking of the kingdom of darkness. But now he has re reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Because the devil just loves to accuse all of the brethren of Jesus. And if you continue in your faith, established and firm, see we have to continue walking in the light, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, the good news of God to us. But we have been qualified by Jesus 
and are being re reconciled to our Heavenly Father, the Father qualifies us through Jesus, His Son, and we are the recipients of that. Now the light was available in the Garden of Eden. It was known as the Tree of Life. But Adam and Eve chose the other tree, the tree they weren't supposed to eat of, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's notice that over in Genesis 3, because this has set the course of human events up until Jesus came and died for all of us, and forgave our sins. So in Genesis 3 and verse 1, we see in the garden, the serpent was more crafty in verse 1 than any of the wild animals of the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So you see the deceptive Satan, how he works. It's the way he phrases a question. It's the way a lot of pollsters take polls too. It's how you phrase the question and to show what kind of response he's looking for. And he found exactly the kind of response he was looking for. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. So the first question, she gave the right response. Then he asked another question. In verse 4, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. So he contradicts what she said. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, that was attractive to her, to know these kind of things, all on her own, without anybody's help. But she was only being deceived here. Adam was the one who was going to actually do the sin. In verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. So she used all the physical abilities she had to determine whether it was good or not. The problem with good and evil is that it mixes together and you get a, a mixture of it. You don't get just good or just evil, usually. You get good and evil. So it mixes stirs together, it's called life. And sometimes it looks good, and other times it doesn't look good. But then when it looked good and then doesn't look good later, it's too late to change the course of action. We've already stepped in it, and now we're going to have to pay the consequences. So she, and just looking at it, it looked desirable. And she also gave then some to her husband. And the husband knew what the Lord had told both of them. He knew that. He was with her, and then he ate it without any talk or discussion or in instructions of any kind. He would just hear, take it and eat. And he did, and then he knew better, and he sinned. She didn't know better because Satan's a good deceiver. And he gave her the old sales pitch, and it just sounded like the best thing to do. Adam knew better, and therefore there they were. They had already taken of the tree the knowledge of good and evil. And their eyes were open, but then they realized they were naked. <laughs> Whoa! Now it was comfortable before it became uncomfortable, totally. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings from themselves, the most uncomfortable leaves in the world to make clothing out of, because it's prickly. In verse 8, And the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord, whereas before they would have said, Oh, hi, God, so good to see you today. And he would say, So good to see you, my children. But this day they were filled with what? Fear. What comes with the knowledge of good and evil? Fear. What leaves a person? Love. So they were fearful of God now. They didn't know what he was going to do. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? because he wanted to talk with him. He always talked with him. And he answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And so we hide from God, who only has good for us. He wants us to partake of the tree of life, and now we can't, because now we would make wrong choices about the tree of life. And we have to be banned from the garden. And we're banned from the garden until Jesus comes. And he brings the tree of life with him. And he said, I am the life. Come to me, and I will give it to you more abundantly. 
And that's found over in John, the 10th chapter. So let's look at that at this time. John 10 and verse 7. John 10 and verse 7. Now Jesus has come, He's been sent by the Father to save us from our sin and death and give us life and not be cursed by the law. The penalty would be paid for in full by Jesus Himself. He would die on that cross. He'd be the Son of God who would go represent us on the cross and take all the sins of the world upon Himself and die as a criminal and our sins would be paid for completely past present and future and then he would raise himself from the dead as the son of God and we would have access to his spirit life for eternity so here he is talking about this in the future and to his disciples and to us today John 10 verse 7 therefore Jesus said again very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them, thankfully. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Just like in Psalms 23, and David said, you know, he, he prepares for us green pasture. Good to eat, nourishing for, for life. And that's what Jesus does for us today. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's all the devil wants to do. He, he bids you to come in. He's going to give you all these things, but then it just to get you in so he can somehow kill you off so you don't live for any more than a few years of your physical life, and then it's over for you. Jesus says, come, follow me. I'll give you life now and life to come for eternity. So which one do you want? Well, of course, we, we want the one that has all the blessings with no curses. Well, that's Jesus then. And we go to him, he gives us life, and he gives it to us more abundantly. And it says that, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, in verse 10. And to the full means abundantly. I mean, there's no room for anything else. It just, you press down all the goodness of what life it has to give us. It's a press down. And that's, that's wonderful. Well, how can it get any better than this? Well, come, he says, follow me, I'll show you. In verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And that is the difference. He lays down his life for the sheep. He gives up his life so we can have life. See, that's why God wanted Adam and Eve to partake of the tree of life in the center of the garden. But He said, not yet. Because it, He wanted them to make a choice not to take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they could take of the tree of life. God has given us choice. We choose how we're going to go. We know that if we're divided as a household, we're going to have chaos. And if you're having that situation today, you need to repent of that and go to Jesus. Because there's no way to have life out of chaos. All we have is death. All we have is destruction. All we have is chaos. And that doesn't bring forth good fruit. So we realize that Jesus wants us to seek Him. So we who believe in Jesus say, come. Jesus calls you to come. We are, if we believe in Jesus, have been reconciled to our Heavenly Father. We are ministers of His reconciliation. And He wants us to minister to those who also want to have life for eternity and be a part of God's love forever. God has given us in relationship a relationship with the Holy Spirit. When we believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts. And then the Holy Spirit guides us into the unity and love of God. And that is expressed over in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> Ephesians, the fourth chapter. 
the Holy Spirit, as it says in John 14, is going to bring us all the truth that God has for us in Jesus so we can receive it and understand it and apply that relationship in our living. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. He helps us to feel like we belong to God, that we are meaningful to God in relationship. Uh, he wants us to know that God is for us always and never against us. He wants us to be one in God. And the wonderful, amazing thing about what happened when Jesus died and paid for our sins and rose from the dead is that He and the Father, then, whom we knew at that time, they came to live in our hearts through the Holy Spirit's dwelling. And they then brought us into their life. The oneness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they brought us into their relationship. It says that over in John 17. That is an amazing thing. See, so we're not just eating of the tree of life. He's included us to be a part of the tree of life as his children. Hard to comprehend that kind of intimacy. God is still one, so we're not God. But we're included with God in the most amazing way. It's like it says over in Ephesians 2.6. It says, when we believe, He lifts us up into the heavens to be right next to Him, to be seated right there next to Him. And He's seated right next to the Father. And that's our true reality. But it's hard for us to understand it if we don't believe that God loves us unconditionally. And He wants us to have life abundantly. So over in Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul is describing here how the Holy Spirit brings us into the unity that takes away from the division that we have when we're not connected. No, when we're, doing, when we're divided and we're not connected. The division that we have that will have us fall and collapse. So in Ephesians 4 and verse 1, as a prisoner for the Lord then, the Apostle Paul believed Jesus and he gave his whole life to Jesus. So he had that oneness that Jesus is wanting to give to each and every one of us. I urge you then to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. It's a journey. It takes time to understand how can God be this good to me? But he is. And so Paul had been on this journey for a while. And he was trying to encourage the uh, brethren at uh, Ephesus to join with him in the unity that he had received himself. And he said in verse 2, be completely humble and gentle. See, because God is like that. He's humble and gentle. He's not like the devil wanting to take from you and give you death in return. He wants us to live forever with him. I mean, he really likes us. He, when Adam and Eve walked and talked with him in the, in the garden, he, he just looked forward to those times of the day. And he'd come and walk with them. And he walks with us in Jesus and the Holy Spirit 24-7. Every moment of every day he's with us because he loves us and wants to be with us forever. So he's completely humble and gentle toward us. He'd be patient, bearing with one another in love. We don't all think exactly the same way and we don't have to. But when we think differently, we don't have to be harsh or condemning about it. We just need to share. And it's the sharing of our different ideas that sometimes gives, oh, I never thought of that before. And we have a different perspective of the topic we're talking about. So, you know, one of the greatest uh, ways of doing that in our society, at least in years past, was to go to the barber shop. And you'd hear all the world news in the barber shop chair. You know, and you'd give your opinion, and you'd give your opinion to the barber, then the guy next to you in the other chair, he'd give his opinion. And you'd have this lively discussion sometimes about life. Oh, well, God allows us to have different opinions, but he wants us to do it out of the love that he's given to us. And verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So we have to make the effort to do this. It just it doesn't come naturally because the darkness in the world is still around us. We have to realize, you know, we're the light, 
we need to move into the darkness. The darkness will move if we move into it, but we have to make a conscious effort to do that and to share God's love in that way. So, there it is. The Spirit will lead us in unity through the bond of peace. Because the fruit that we're after in expressing God's love is His peace. In verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. So we have to be able to get to the, the things that matter. The things that matter in this world are the kingdom of God on earth. Now it's not here yet. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this earth, but we represent his kingdom to come, which is the kingdom of light. So we're his ambassadors because we believe in him. And therefore we know it's coming. So we represent his light. We are his light because he lives in us. And we want to represent that on the earth. But we see that it has a fruit. It has a fruit. It has love. It has unity. It has peace. And those are the fruits of it. And Paul goes on here as he talks about the one hope that we were called. One Lord, one faith in verse 5. One baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And that's what makes it unified. The thing that God loves, though, is diversity. Look at the creation that God has given to us. So much diversity in it. You say, wow, look at this beautiful creation. It's all diverse. And yet it's all one. It's all unified. We have peace and hope that comes from that. And we say, I wish the whole world could be this way. Well, you know, in the future, it will be this way. The whole world will be this way because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, so that we could be saved and not condemned. So let's stand in the unity that God has given to us in Jesus Christ. Let's express the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives this coming week. Let's show that God reigns. He's the one who can cast out darkness and does. But he uses us to move darkness out of the way through our sharing the ministry of reconciliation that he's given to us all. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for giving us your house that is not divided, and it does stand. The world's house is divided, and it cannot stand. And one day it will be totally gone, because only your way will remain. In the meantime, we all have a ministry of reconciliation. Jesus has given reconciliation to us. He's given it to all of us. Help us to receive it and then to minister it and to be the ambassadors of the kingdom of light that we are. We ask and pray you'll bless us, you'll give us understanding, that you'll help us to walk forward in boldness, but yet in love and peace and hope. Because the world tomorrow is coming. The wonderful world tomorrow is coming where you return in glory. But in the meantime, we have a ministry to do, and we ask and pray you'll help us to do it. We thank you for this opportunity. We give you all the glory, dear Heavenly Father. It's in the most precious and holy name of Jesus Christ that we pray, and all together we say, Amen. Amen.